Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. A generation ago, the first President Bush proclaimed a new world order which America would lead by example. 25 years on and Donald Trump is in the White House, so what kind of example is America setting now? Well, my guest is Joe Lieberman, former U.S. Senator, Al Gore's vice presidential running mate in 2000, and recently touted as a contender for FBI director under the current president. Is Donald Trump fundamentally changing America's global role? Joe Lieberman, welcome to Harvard. Stephen, good to be with you. Thank you. Let's begin, I think, where we have to begin, with an assessment of Donald Trump. He's had pretty much six months in the White House. Are you alarmed or reassured by what you see? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm uncertain. I mean, obviously, uh, President Trump ran a campaign unlike any uh, we've seen in America. I can tell you, as a former office holder, during the year I would run into... Uh, other former office holders or current elected officials and we we would point to the latest thing that then candidate Trump had said which we all agreed would have ended our, our campaign if we had said <laughs> it but but he kept going and part of it was clearly that uh, the, the public wanted a change wanted an outsider uh, wanted and in, in one sense somebody because he was a successful businessman they thought uh, might be able to make the government work again. So, and he's brought the same style, the same spirit, and the same unpredictability yeah. into his White House. Right. But I just wonder whether you think that is appropriate, whether it is the right thing for America at this time, or whether you see dangers in it. Well, I, I think he's got... He has real strengths, but he's really got to be more disciplined. And part of why I think the uh, people elected him is for change, he's implemented some change by executive uh, order, uh, regulation uh, withdrawal, pulling out of the um, climate change uh, pact, uh, changing, uh, withdrawing us from the TPP trade agreement. Uh, personally, those are steps that, I, that I, I don't agree with and I'm disappointed by, but they do represent uh, change. Um, th the next most important thing I think he has to do, and it hasn't happened yet, is to prove that his capacity uh, uh, as a leader and his experience as a negotiator uh, enables him to do something that hasn't been done very much in recent years in Washington, which is to bring uh, Republicans and Democrats together, each to compromise to achieve something. And right now... But that's not happening. It's and the not, atmosphere seems happening. as to toxic, as poisonous, maybe more so than ever before. Right. And it's, it's on both sides. The Democrats are now the out party. The Democrats are the out party, this is my party. Well, hang but, on a minute. I, yeah. I think we need to clarify for yes. audience what your party is, because you say <laughs> that's my party. You, you famously quit the Democratic Party, what, more than 10 years ago. You ran against them and won your right. Connecticut Senate seat as an independent. Yeah. You then infuriated so many in your party by actually backing John McCain for president yeah. against Barack Obama in 2008. Right. So I have to ask you, did you vote for Trump? No. Oh, no. I, I strongly uh, supported Hillary Clinton, and of course I... But you're not I a Democrat, for, really. Well, well, I'm still a registered Democrat. Remember what but happened... But many, many Democrats regard you, and I'm going to yeah. be brutal with you, they regard you as an out-and-out -out traitor. Yeah, unfairly. I mean, in 2006, because I stuck with the Iraq War longer than others did, and this is part of the, what, uh, the toxic atmosphere in our politics, even though my voting record was a progressive voting record, certainly on domestic issues, uh, I was challenged, fair enough, in a Democratic pr primary, and I lost. It, uh, it's the old Ronald Reagan line. It's not so much that I left the Democratic Party as the Democratic Party uh, left me. Uh, but on the other hand, unlike Reagan, well, that, I didn't that, become a Republican. With all due respect, that perspective depends somewhat on the size of your ego. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, no, no. There was a, uh, what I'm really saying is that the Democratic Party rejected my candidacy for re-election to the U.S. Senate. Earlier in the year, one of my consultants said, you should run as, a as, a, as an independent, because I'm afraid the Iraq war is going to do you in. And I said, what? I am a Democrat. I, if they don't, they're going to have to push me out 
if they don't think I'm capable of running. And they, of course, they did. And then I was lucky enough to get elected. And I want to come back to that, uh, to the extent that America may still be open to a different brand of politics, yeah. getting away from the binary right. Republican Democrat thing later in this interview. But I, okay. I want to stick with Trump for a moment okay. because what intrigues me right now is that just within the last month or two, you seriously toyed with the proposition of joining the Trump team, in a sense, by uh, taking seriously the thought you might become Trump's new director of the FBI. How could you do that if you, as it seems from the beginning of this interview, have serious reservations about right. the Trump style? Uh, I was raised to believe that um, if, if the President of the United States calls you to service the, the of the country, you have a, a profound obligation uh, to take that seriously and probably do it unless there's a good reason. Really? E yes. Even, even now, if it's Donald Trump e in e the circumstances e yes. where he's fired his FBI chief well. because, and we now know from the testimony of James Comey, James Comey basically feels that Donald Trump was telling him to close down an investigation into his first uh, national security advisor, General Mike Flynn, all connected with the well, allegations. I, I, I don't want to quibble about words. I mean, you know, as we all know, Comey said, uh, the president said, I hope you will... Uh, exactly. Uh, go, go Here's easy, what Comey said. Comey said, and this is a, a, a direct quote from him, uh, his recollection was that Trump said, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go to letting Flynn go. He's a good guy. I hope you can let this go. Yes. So, so here's the point. I suppose it's possible that there might be a president with whom I had such profound agreement on foreign and domestic policy that I, I would not seriously disagreement, consider... Disagreement, you mean. A disagreement. Yeah. I would not uh, seriously consider uh, what I normally would do and offer or a call to serve the country. But you don't think Trump's crossed I, that I, line? I, I don't think he's crossed that line. Certainly not yet. I agree with a lot of what he's done uh, on foreign policy. And, uh, of course, I had the, uh, the confidence, the ego, to think that perhaps I could make a difference as director of the FBI. So just take me, if you would, into that conversation you had with Donald Trump. I know in the end you recused yourself because you, you believed there was a conflict was. of interest based on right. your activities in your law firm. Right. But, but when you and Trump discussed the possibility of you becoming his new FBI chief, did he at any point say, you know what, Joe, if you take this job, you're going to have to go easy on this Russia thing, as he calls it? Because he's always called it fake news. Right. Quite the opposite happened, and it's really important to say this. I don't like to talk about conversations that I have with someone like the president, but we talked about this. We talked about, because this was post-Comey, of course. Well, you have to talk you about it. You have to talk about it. And uh, he said, I would never ask you to do something or not do something that, that you didn't want to do. You're, you're, be, you're the director of FBI. You have to do what you think the law and the evidence requires you to do. And of course, then he added, and I didn't ask Comey to do anything either. So uh, I, I will say, I, I don't know President Trump very well. I've met him over the years in different ways. Um, during the, and I, I, I'm aware of, of the, some of the things he said during the campaign were just, I thought, awful. The, yeah, so it the, comes the, down to this, if, some of the, Senator, if I may, it comes down to this. If you were to even consider being his FBI chief, yeah. you would have to surely believe that he is a truth teller and that he is a man you could respect. Can you tick both of those boxes? I think he, uh, I don't think he's gone over the line on either of those. I think his presidency is a work in progress. And the director of the FBI is an important role, and I, I just didn't think I. I think you're not kidding. I mean, yeah, and I just I couldn't say I, I wouldn't do it. And to me, this is part of the problem in Washington. I don't like it that Democrats, my party, have gone into what they themselves are calling the resistance. In other words, anything Trump recommends, forget it. We're opposed to it. Uh, what happens uh, in that case is that. Uh, the, the country doesn't solve any of its problems or take advantage of any of its opportunities because there's no compromise to actually uh, get things done. We're not going to deal with immigration reform or uh, budget uh, deficits or uh, infrastructure or tax reform or any of the rest that we need to deal with. They're, they're, people need to cool down a bit and not look at people in the other party as the enemy. Do, I, I, as you know, and uh, President Trump and I discussed this, he knows that I was a strong supporter of Secretary Clinton last year. But 
that didn't stop him from asking me to do this. And the fact that I didn't support him and have disagreed with some of the things he's done as president, I didn't think should stop me from considering taking on this responsibility. Just a final thought on that, country. and then we'll move on. But in the last few days, Trump has publicly reflected on the friendship between James Comey, whom he fired, and Robert Mueller, who is now the special counsel in charge of investigating yeah. all of these Russia allegations. Trump has said he finds it very bothersome that Mueller and Comey are friends. Do you think he has a right to say that and say it in public? Uh, I, uh, well, <laughs> one thing we have to accept is that President Trump will say a lot of things in public that other elected leaders have traditionally not said. I, I understand, particularly because he feels as if he's been unfairly targeted, why he would worry as a result of learning about a, a really what I think is a professional friendship relationship between uh, Comey and Mueller. My own feeling, um, I don't know Comey. I do, I do know Mueller, Bob Mueller. Um, he's first rate, um, um, and I think he has I don't know how to phrase this. There's at least as, as high a likelihood that Bob Mueller will look at the facts and decide that the president has done nothing uh, wrong or actionable here as that he will find uh, wrongdoing. I mean, in other words, you, I, I think well, he's, a, he's independent. You lived through the impeachment of a Democratic president, Bill Clinton, right. uh, at the end of the last century. Mm -hmm. Do you think, now that you look at how this is unfolding, that we may see the impeachment of Donald Trump? Uh, I would be surprised, but um, who knows? I mean, in other words, there's something, something based on what we have heard so far, uh, including Comey saying in his testimony before the Senate that there was no evidence that he's seen of the president being involved in collusion with the Russians in their meddling in the U.S. Uh, election, that uh, the, the case really is, uh, <laughs> did the president uh, do something at worst criminal, uh, probably not, uh, uh, to try to protect uh, General Flynn from uh, prosecution. So my, my guess is that there's going to be a lot, a lot of sound and fury coming out of Capitol Hill, but in the end, M Bob Mueller, the special counsel, is the one who really ha has the power to do something or not do something, and he's going to decide it. I I'd be very surprised if this ends up in an impeachment. Let me ask you about the Democratic Party. I am intrigued that you keep, in this interview, calling it my party. Yeah. I interviewed, just a couple of weeks ago, Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Now, Bernie Sanders says the lessons of the last election cycle are quite clear, that the American people are fed up with the elites that have run their lives and neglected their interests for so long. He says the Democratic Party has been a part of that problem. The system is rigged against ordinary people. It is rigged in favor of the billionaires. And the Democrats must find a leadership that is prepared to express that basis for fighting a political battle against the Republicans. Do you agree with him? Um, only in very small part, which is to say that there are some people in the U.S. Who, who feel that way. But uh, in my opinion, there are a lot more who want uh, Republicans and Democrats to come together and actually get something done. And I think Bernie Sanders did as well as he did in the primaries, only in part because of um, what I would call a what, what far left approach, or what, however one describes his, his ideology, a kind of resistance. <laughs> Approach. Yeah, you but say I, you say the Democrats have to get over this idea that yeah, they must present they, they, resistance to Trump. But Sanders is saying, absolutely on the contrary, the only way we build a movement that can take back the White House, win the Congress, is to resist. Right. Perhaps this is a, a, a way to clarify what I'm saying. Uh, I think Democrats have a responsibility to oppose Trump when they have a policy reason to do so, and I, and they should do it with uh, with real vigor. Uh, at some point, they've got to decide, for instance, on health care or tax reform, whether they want to negotiate to actually get something done or whether this is going to be two years of screaming at each other. So it's really the, the difference between what seems to me at times to be a mindless um, uh, resistance. Anything Trump or the Republicans want, we're against. Uh, and, and really principled and aggressive promotion of a different set of ideas. Are you not part of the problem? You are 
a lawyer, you're a, a, a Beltway insider, you've spent much of your life either in New York or Washington. You're an elite Democrat. Yeah. You are precisely the reason the Democrats are not getting traction in, for example, the Rust Belt states where Donald Trump actually found his path to victory. Well, I don't think so, needless to say. Um, mostly I spent my life in Connecticut. And I always did very well in Connecticut among working class Democrats, independents, and sometimes Republicans. And I think it's because they knew uh, I wasn't a captive of any uh, political group that I was really going to be fighting for them and trying to get things done for them and, and, and the state, including uh, to help them uh, economically. All right, and one element you've just said in, in your uh, attraction to a certain brand of, of democratic politics was a muscular foreign policy. Yes. But ultimately, you walked out of your party precisely because of your differences with the mainstream of the party mm. on a host of foreign policy issues, but most particularly Iraq, which you've already mentioned. Seems to me you haven't learned the lessons of what America has done in the Middle East over the last, what, two decades. Endless interventions, endless commitment and belief that America could change the rules of the game and sow the seeds of democracy in a host of countries where they are not used, don't have a history of democracy, and it has failed time and again, and yet you seem to remain a hawkish liberal interventionist. Yeah. Why? Let, let me see, because I think that's the right place for us, us to be. Let me see again. In the face I, of the yeah, evidence. Yeah, no, no, it's, I don't agree with the evidence as you've stated it. <laughs> let, let me say again that I didn't walk away from the Democrats. And this is really important. The Democratic Party rejected my candidacy for re election based on one issue, Iraq. And it was classic of what politics is in America. I believed that if we, I knew that uh, I was supported the war. I knew that the Bush administration made very serious mistakes after the war was won in trying to reconstruct Iraq. But I thought that if we withdrew, it would be a cataclysm, not only for Iraq, but for American credibility in the world. And a lot depends on American credibility in the world. My record beyond that was a pretty uh, a strong pro Democratic, that is pro-democratic party record. And well, yet let's I was take rejected. another example and let's leave Iraq for a yeah. moment and talk about Iran. Barack Obama spent years, invested a huge amount of time and effort in pulling together a nuclear deal with the Iranians, with, of course, the international community, the so-called P5 plus one. He got it. He got the deal. The deal's intact. Rex Tillerson testified just a couple of months ago saying the Iranians are meeting the conditions of that deal. And yet you continue to say, I think one time you called it shameful, you called it an, uh, an egregious mistake, and you continue to call for new sanctions to be placed on Iran. Yes. Why? Why? Because Iran has not changed. Iran is still by our own State Department determination, the number one state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, Iran uh, is uh, using its power and has tens of thousands of its own forces in Syria, which has become a bloodbath, a kind of genocide of the uh, Syrian people. Iran represses its own people in a way, that is, the regime does, in a way that is uh, brutal and well, unacceptable. This is all way more complicated than, than perhaps you've just outlined. I mean, for example, in Syria, Iran is backing Bashar al-Assad, who to even some in Washington now represents some sort of stability in the face of the threat yeah, from Islamic it, State and other jihadist organizations. Well, that's not, and that's equally a, in Iraq, that's Iran's role choice. is Iran's role in Iraq has been over years essentially been buttressed by the war that America started. The, uh, r right now, we're actually doing much better in our relations with the government in Iraq, and we're being quite successful in Mosul, uh, particularly in rolling back uh, ISIS or uh, Daesh. Um, I don't know where to begin to respond. <laughs> I am here in uh, London and, and part as chair of a group called United Against Nuclear Iran. We mostly have focused on trying to convince businesses uh, since 2008 to observe the economic sanctions and not do business uh, in Iraq. Since the Iran nuclear agreement, we've been saying to businesses, don't rush in there now. It's still a high risk situation for any business because a lot of the other sanctions uh, are still there. You may suffer economically and it's 
it remains a place where there's not really rule of law. There's tremendous corruption. There's a, a, a dominant influence by the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which has been but, designated a terrorist organization. Therefore, if any business does business with it, it may subject itself to crippling we, sanctions. We don't have much time left, so mm -hmm. just quick fire thoughts from you on the role of America in the world today, particularly under Trump. Trump said he was going to rip up that deal with the Iranians, yeah. but it's quite clear now he's not going to rip it right. up. He also came into office saying he was going to move the Israeli embassy to Jerusalem, something you very actively supported. Correct. Now seems he's not going to do that either. Do you think that Donald Trump in reality is rather different from the Donald Trump of Twitter promises and outrageous comments? The, the, the foreign policy of the Trump administration is a work in progress. So some of the changes uh, from what he stated during the campaign that you um, describe actually should be uh, encouraging to people who are in a panic about what a Trump Indeed. presidency would recommend. But not necessarily to, encouraging to you because you're no, in a sense more hawkish than he is in I, some of these matters. I, I accept the, <laughs> that, that a foreign policy is broad uh, and uh, I don't like the breaking of the trade agreements. I don't um, like the uh, pulling out of the climate change uh, pact, et cetera. But uh, I think it's, there's a steadiness uh, uh, moving toward change on most of the foreign policy. The big area of change in the Trump foreign policy from uh, President Obama is in the Middle East. And I think Trump has said very clearly, we have two enemies in the Middle East, and I think he's right, um, Iran and ISIS. And we have friends. The friends are in the Arab world and in Israel. And we are gonna support our friends and oppose our enemies until they prove to us, Iran, that they're no longer our enemies, which Iran continues to not prove. So that's significant and it's already had effects on the ground, both in terms of the unprecedented diplomatic and military activity by the Gulf Arab nations uh, and this remarkable uh, coming together of the Arabs and the Israelis. A final quietly. thought, though, when you talk about his change of policy from Obama in the Middle East, you're focused on one particular part of the world, but you're perhaps not taking account of what Trump means and the impact he's having on America's partners and allies yeah. around the world. Let me end this interview by quoting you Angela Merkel. She said, it is time for Germany and for Europe to take their fate in their own hands. The times that we could rely on others, and clearly she meant the United States, sure. are somewhat over. Do you not worry, as an internationalist, as a guy who's always wanted America to play a very active role in the world, that under Donald Trump, America's most staunch partners and allies have fundamental doubts about whether America is still the world's leading power. Well, of course I do, because I've always believed in a foreign policy that builds on our alliances. Um, and I, I would urge people like Chancellor Merkel and others who have, have doubts about President Trump's foreign policy to, to give it a chance and, and see where it goes and acknowledge that though he said NATO, for instance, was obsolete and then when he came here to Europe, uh, didn't say that he supported Article 5 of the NATO Charter. Then later he did say he, he supported it. So I, I think he's going to prove himself to be a better ally than, than people uh, think. And Trump, I have to say, you are remarkably kind about Donald Trump. The cynic in me wonders whether you're still hoping he might offer you a job. No, I think I can say that, that when he offered me that job, it was a, a time of uh, real strain within myself. And when he first called me, I said to him, Mr. President, I'm honored, uh, and I'll think about it because you're the president. But I must tell you, I love my life since I left the Senate. And, uh, and I still feel that way, so I'm quite happy. Well, we must end there. Joe Lieberman, thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you. See you soon.